Thank you, computer voice. And Eloise, over to you. Who do we have first? Okay, so our first speaker today is going to be Justine. Um, and so, yeah, Justine, do you want to come on over and introduce your topic? Absolutely. And will I be able to share my screen? Let's me just do ta -ta -ta. one sec, Justine. Yes, we can see yeah. that wonderful poster wow. presentation of yours. Good. Awesome. All right. So uh, just on a side note, I did not do this for tonight. Uh, it was actually put together for BPS. Um, they had a research, uh, graduate research day uh, in Scotland, which I, um, I did it for um, in the month of August. So it wasn't the, it wasn't something I just put together uh, in in a few hours as uh, as I reached out to Eloise to uh, to request to come on today. Um, so I did my MSc in business psych at Harriet Watts, and um, always been really really interested around diversity and inclusion, which is uh, as we all know, uh, diversity and inclusion in the workplace is a big big hype. Uh, and especially more so um, as we progress uh, in this new kind of realm of, of environment of working from home and all these things that the, the world has been going through uh, in the last few years, it's really at the forefront um, as a subject. And so just as a, as a brief context, diversity initially came up to be quite uh, an important topic when it comes to um, realizing the benefits of having a diverse workforce and also um, what kind of things it brings. So uh, increasing productivity, um, you know, increasing uh, financial, uh, financial results. And so that was really the focus at the beginning. And now we're transitioning transitioning in research more towards um, the feelings of inclusion. So how do we actually create uh, an environment of inclusion? Because exclusion is actually one of the most critical problems in workplaces when people that are not homogeneous come together. So in order to get those diversity benefits, there's really an importance to um, create that uh, inclusive uh, workplace. So that's really where research is uh, in terms of DNI at the moment. And so my objective with this research um, was twofold. So the first part was to examine the differences in levels of inclusion. And so initially inclusion was pretty broad and obviously people have different concepts of what inclusion is and I took the focus of saying that well inclusion is not just uh, a sense of belonging but it's also um, feeling authentic so those two concepts together is what makes up inclusion in in the research that I brought forward and the second objective of my research was to uh, explore levels of inclusion with a diversity climate psychological safety and uh, different uh, demographic variables. Uh, and so as you see here, there's eight different identity variables that were uh, considered. So age, gender, uh, sexual orientation, race, nationality, religion, disability, and language. Uh, and in disability, I really uh, in encompassed um, whether it be physical, psychological, or neurological uh, conditions. So all of that was put into uh, disability. Um, I was able to uh, collect um, a sample of 221 participants uh, across uh, the world, if I can say, uh, people that were in uh, the prof professional world, so 18 and over. And um, the four different scales that were used, so I had the uh, authenticity, authenticity measures at work, uh, the psychological sense of organizational membership, diversity perception scale, and psychological safety. And uh, what these results uh, concluded was um, that there were uh, differences in levels in, of inclusion between a disabled and non-disabled uh, workers. And uh, diversity, climate, and psychological safety were uh, good predictors uh, or significant predictors of levels of inclusion. And so 
yeah, that's pretty much uh, in a nutshell what my results and what my research uh, was about. Lovely. Thank you so much for sharing, Justine. Has anyone got any questions or things they'd like to add on the topic? Oh, I, I want to say something, Eloise. Can I? Yeah. <laughs> Justine, I love your research topic. Actually, especially the, 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 the part that is said that uh, this, um, the inclusion criteria is not just the sense of belonging, but also authenticity. This is new for me and makes sense. And thanks for sharing your results and your contribution to the science. Thank you, Amanda. Yeah, excellent. And Command's just put in that it's very interesting. So thank you for sharing. Thank you. Awesome. And Lovely. Anyone? Just one last question. Justine, what do you wish you have known now? Well, wait a second. What would you wish you have known when you started your thesis and doing your research? Yeah, I definitely, I, I, I had big expectations when I went into this. And so one of the things I was really interested in was uh, around intersectionality, right? So um, identifying ourselves, not only as one spectrum, we are a broad range of various identities, right? So I am woman, I am white, uh, I am Canadian, et cetera. And due to the, the sample of my uh, my research, I was not able to encompass uh, the and Inter in intersectionality, pardon me, of, of um, this kind of scope. And so um, I did reach out to various um, associations to see if they would be willing to uh, share my, my research. And uh, maybe my, my approach was not necessarily as um, uh, aggressive or I didn't necessarily show their an incentive for them. And so, because of that, I, I was not able to to reach the yeah to reach the scope that I would have liked. Um, and so, just proper proper uh, planning at the beginning, uh, if you want to work with various associations, to really make sure that they they know what's in it for them. Um, because if you just say, "Well, I need help," uh, if they don't see it as as an incentive, they will not necessarily put in the effort to to reach out in their network to so it really needs to be kind of a yeah a win win situation and in that way uh, there could definitely be a broader reach if you're looking to have like a, a bigger sample size and and uh, yeah bigger reach. It's how to involve them sooner. Uh, I experienced the same with pilot unions because I was recruiting pilots. So not only think it's down to you, but look into organization that can help you to recruit. Though I did get a very strongly email from one pilot union, which was like, yeah, but I didn't work with them afterwards. But there's some nice people out there and nice organizations that can help you. Thank you so much, Justine. Thank you. And Justine, if people want to reach out to you on LinkedIn and talk to you about your research and sort of discuss those sort of things, are you happy for that? Absolutely, yeah. I, anything uh, related to org psych or diversity inclusion, I'm, I'm all for it. So do please reach out to me. Okay, I have a quick you. question if there's still time, but if yeah, we have to move on. Um, hi, really, um, really interesting research and thank you so much for, for sharing. I was really interested in the psychological safety part. Um, can you elaborate a little bit? So, did you say that the psychological safety was predicting inclusion or was inclusion predicting psychological safety or what was the relationship and do you have some yeah. thoughts? Yeah, so I was saying, uh, so psychological safety was considered as a predictor. So it basically means it will predict uh, levels of inclusion. So uh, the higher you uh, put into a workplace, for instance, psychological safety. So more the culture is a feeling of people can actually speak up without the fear of being reprimanded, um, that it, it actually is prone to people and are people are encouraged to, to share their thoughts, uh, more they will be feeling uh, included in the workplace. And mm -hmm. so in this instance, it was that. So the more you found people felt like there was that kind of culture in their workplace, uh, the more they felt like they uh, could be authentic as well as uh, felt that they belonged. That's nice, thank you. That makes thank you sense. for your question again. Thank you, Justine.
Lovely. Any other questions before we move on? Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Doing Nikita's count to 10 in my head thing. Um, so next up we have Heather. Heather, would you like to come and um, introduce your research topic? Hi there, yeah. Um, my research topic was on COVID-19, so very topical, um, and it was based on the hospitality industry. So it was the impact of COVID-19 on hospitality employees' turnover intentions and the implications for organisations' talent management practices. Mm -hmm. The reason why I chose this topic is it's very close to home for me because I obviously work in HR within hospitality and work in recruitment. And uh, even though I was on furlough, we were obviously called back halfway through me doing my master's to come back and I, I couldn't believe what a change that first lockdown had created for us for recruitment. I mean, there was people wanting to work on our industry everywhere. It was it was unbelievable. We, we never experienced that before. So I thought, as I had a potential participant for my um, co-workers, that I would dive in and do that. Unfortunately, I didn't do the research until after the second lockdown, um, which things changed quite dramatically from that point of view. Now, I don't know, oh, hopefully some of you have worked in hospitality. Most of you, I'm sure, have eaten out in hospitality at some point. Um, I'm probably reading the papers exactly how challenging it can be. You know, hospitality, particularly in the UK, is really well known for its long antisocial hours, low pay, low skill, high emotional costs and stress levels. Often there's a poor work-life balance um, and there can be limited career development. However, there is low entry requirements as well. So it can get quite a few people that may not have been successful at school entering the profession. We don't have a great personal environment fit because often people may not have achieved the grades they've wanted. So they've fallen into our profession, which means that they might not have the right sort of personality to begin with. Um, you know, it's the ease of access and there might have been other roles out there that might suit their disposition better, but unfortunately hospitality was all they could access. Other people, maybe some of you yourselves, maybe your students, use it as a, transi a transient role, as a springboard into alternative careers. So already we're quite faced with quite a few challenges in hospitality trying to get people to come and join us. Um, when you are actually working in hospitality, you've got three main stakeholders, which are your co-workers, supervisors and customers. Um, you know, and that can be quite a lot of emotional stress because when you're working on the front line, like hospitality workers do, you know, you can't have a bad day. Even if your, you know, your coworker might be having a bad day, might be having a pop at you in the kitchen. And same with when you go out front, and your guests might not be so happy, and then your manager might be quite cross with how you're performing. There's a lot of emotional stress being put on our employees. So, along with all the other bits that I've just described, you can imagine why they might not want to uh, be our first option to work in our industry. So. This um, piece of work that I did, the method of it all was I used um, the general, I wanted to find out if it was uh, job engagement, if they had high job engagement, would that reduce their turnover intentions? And would that, and also would job engagement linked to higher psychological health? So to assess this, we, the method I used was using the general health questionnaire, the work and wellbeing survey, and also a turnover intention from Dibas and Unger. Um, to uh, as a questionnaire and I sent that out to all of the um, people in my workplace and I was lucky that 169 of them uh, replied to that so in the end my study consisted of 160 participants and um, with a mainly female sample though with 118 females and 40 males and then two that uh, identified as non-binary. Now I then used um, with the results I used multiple regression and then moderated multiple regression to see what the results would come back with. And the results of the study was that the higher psychological health does positively correlate with lower turnover intentions, suggesting that improved psychological health and well-being reduces hospitality employees' intentions to leave their roles. With higher job engagement, also negatively correlated with lower turnover intentions, indicating that hospitality employees' job engagement increases their turnover intentions, decrease, if that makes sense. So I should have paused a bit there. <laughs> but hopefully you followed what I meant there. I did find a relationship between hospitality's job engagement with psychological health and turnover intentions, but I didn't find any of them having a moderating effect. I also collected um, information on their roles and their experience to see if that had a moderating effect, but I didn't find that to have any at all. Uh, what I did find from the study was that um, this, it supported the work engagement concept that um, Baker and L had proposed in their 2008 work, 
and also additional support to Hobbol's conversational resource theory. But obviously, the more theory, the more um, available resources available to people, it will either spiral positively, but the more you take away, it will be negative. Um, and that then gave me quite a lot of information based on this to sort of like go back to um, my employers and sort of say, you know, what I found here is that the more sort of well-being that we can increase in our employees, the more job engagement will come from them and then hopefully have higher psychological health with the extra well-being that we're providing them. Um, and I sort of gave a few recommendations along the lines of increasing communication, especially between supervisors. A lot of research out there about supervisors um, can have a big impact on how their employees feel and engage them more. Um, also about the person environment fit about encouraging, you know, can, can we be more flexible? You know, we've got lots of roles in hospitality. If someone's not working well another role, maybe offer them something else and that might increase their engagement and retention. Um, also about women in the workplace. We have a high percentage of women working in hospitality, but unfortunately they generally don't get into managerial roles and that can reduce their engagement and their well-being. So looking at perhaps having some sort of like mentorship for women and trying to increase the talent pool with women. Um, and just overall that we just need to focus on initiatives for well-being and increasing the resources collection um yeah so there you go <laughs> have you got any questions for me lovely thank you so much for presenting heather yes has anyone got any questions you know you've got your hand up oh no that was a supportive uh, well done <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> thank you um i'm um you mentioned your, your turnover variable. Can I can I just ask a little bit more about that and how you measured that? Yeah. So basically, it was just two questions area that I'd found. Um, you know, which was, are you planning on being with this in, a, in in six months' time? And that was it. Really, it was um, it was a very limited part of it. I think if I had to redo it again, I would actually make that survey a little bit longer. And I would um, also reduce the work engagement survey I use. I used the, the larger sample, the, the middle one. I used the middle one, but I used a short version of the, um, the health questionnaire. So I, I think that might have slanted some of my results. I was a little bit disappointed not to get any moderating effects. Let's put it that way. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, um, I had a question actually. How did you find um, sort of the dynamics of working within sort of the organization that you already work in? With them, what do you mean with doing the research? Yeah. Um, uh, to be honest, it's something that we'd all been talking about, but no one had done any research into. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this wasn't my original plan. I wasn't really going to do this at first. I wanted to do diversity and inclusion, um, particularly because I find, again, um, in hospitality, you know, we don't seem to have a lot of diversity in the top roles. But when I came back to work and I sort of like found suddenly how challenging or well, how great a recruitment suddenly was and how challenging it suddenly became, um, I really thought this would be something that could really help not just myself, but my colleagues. So. Yeah, no, it seems like you came out with a lot of valuable outcomes from the results that you found, some good suggestions. Karina, have you got a question? Um, Heather, so first of all, well done for conducting this research. Very relevant, very valuable. Um, I was just wondering um, what uh, confounding variables have you, have you considered um, doing this research in, within your own workplace? Oh, I actually, I think I had about almost two pages of that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I did have quite a few confounding variables. For example, um, when I put it out there, I put it out to the whole company. I didn't just put it out there to frontline, but most of my literature research was focused on frontline employees and how much stress that they have um, on them. Um, so, but a lot of the people that did respond tended to be in the HR department and they're not working frontline. So those results can't be extrapolated just to the frontline employees, which was my original aim. So again, you know, if I was going to go back and redo that again, that's an area that I'd focus on. Um, I mean, there was just so much as well. I mean, there was a lot of media going on at the time, telling people that hospitality was, you know, in the doldrums. Um, so, you know, people are reading that and probably thinking, let's not go back to hospitality because obviously it's going to be, you know, not great. Also, with a lot of technology changes in hospitality where we're doing a lot more like order at the table and there's been a lot of things going around saying that people are going to lose their job. It's been going to be replaced by apps and things like this. So again, there was, there was, there was quite there was quite a lot of um, confounding variables. I think that you know could have impacted on my results and people's responses. Makes sense. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. And are you happy for people to connect with you on LinkedIn? 
talk about your research if they have something in particular they you know think of after the event yeah absolutely I, I know when I was doing this research I felt everybody else was doing something like um like psychological flexibility and all and all that kind of stuff and I'm like out there with hospitality but <laughs> so if anyone is interested I can talk a lot about it <laughs> <laughs> thank you yeah lovely okay thank you so much then so next up we have Katie Katie would you like to introduce your job topic Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Um, let me just try and share my screen. Mm. Right, you should be able to see it now. Yeah, lovely. Yeah, so um, it's a poster. It is quite big. You can see just bits of it right now. I'm going to try and show you the whole of it. Uh, so I already used it for a presentation. So again, don't worry if some of you haven't done posters or anything. It's just been, I, I decided to do extra because I already had it. Um, so no worries about it. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Katie. I'm doing PhD in general psychology. Uh, but I decided to go with topic of remote working and factors that predict the desire to go to the office and discontinue doing remote working. Uh, I'm doing my PhD at LSVU. I'm at, in my second year, meaning that um, the studies that I'm going to present right now, the data is not yet fully collected. Therefore, we cannot yet draw any inferences. So I'm kind of just talking about the ideas that I have in my head. Um, yeah, and I just wanted to thank uh, the organizers for this opportunity to present. It's really nice uh, to have all of you here listening to me um, regarding the research. Also interesting to listen about other pe other people's research. Uh, so um, just before we start, as you can see, there's a title say, saying factors linked to telework and employees desire to go back to, to office full time. And just to clarify what teleworking is. So teleworking is basically remote working with a necessary use of ICT, meaning that if you need to use uh, computers, phones, internet for your work, then you are a teleworker. Also to be a teleworker, you need to be a salaried one. So uh, being a freelance um, teleworker is impossible. So that will be um, kind of the thing that classify a teleworker. Uh, I'm going to try and make it a bit closer for you so you can see things. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to go with the introduction and kind of the rationale for the studies. Uh, so as most of you know, the remote working has been just skyrocketing due to COVID. And now most, um, and a lot of companies, not most of them, um, want their employees to continue doing remote working at least to some extent and while most people enjoy it which is absolutely great there is a percentage of workers who actually want to go back to the office full time and they unfortunately remain unattended by um, their employers or policymakers. Um, th and therefore the aim of this study would be to find out the factors that make the, those uh, employees to go back to the office full time and try to eliminate them possibly um, so so the objectives for this would be to explore experiences and attitudes of employees who want to go back to the office full time and then develop a scale for measuring this desire because there's no validated scale for it. And lastly, we would investigate pathways by which the desire of going back to office full time occurred, uh, which would then show us what factors kind of predicted their um, desire. So in terms of methods, the first study which I am running at the moment um, is a qualitative semi-structured interviews, exploring experiences of the desire to discontinue teleworking. Um, now that having gone into the data collection, we decided to go with a bit of a broader topic and just looking at experiences of any teleworkers, really. So um, this brings me to the point where um, I just wanted to let you know that I am collecting data. And if you're from the UK um, doing remote working, I have been doing remote working during the last year. I would really appreciate if you contacted me and we could have an informal chat uh, about your experiences. Obviously uh, your uh, participation would be entirely confidential. Uh, so if that's something you're interested in, I'll just pop um, my LinkedIn account to the chat so you can contact me. Uh, so the second study would be designing the scale measuring the desire to go back to office that would be based on a qualitative findings of what we're uh, collecting right now. And the final part 
we statistically test the factors contributing to the desire to discontinue teleworking, and that will be done either by path analysis or statistical equation modeling. But that's um, way ahead because um, I'm just on the first phase of the study, which will import, inf, uh, inform the rest of them. And talking about the contribution to knowledge, so we would fill the knowledge gaps about the factors influencing this desire to go back to office. Also, they will help me to develop a theoretical knowledge of the subject area because um, the um, there is no set theory for teleworking overall, which kind of needs to be done. Uh, and then we would understand how to help those who wish to go back to office full time become more satisfied with teleworking. Um, so that's pretty much it. Um, as I said before, I'm going to pop my link to LinkedIn if you wish to contact me for the participation and I would extremely appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Katie. Um, yeah, I'm really interested to see what the outcomes are when you when you have finished it. So you'll have to come back and do another time and let us know what you found out. Um, has anyone got any questions? Um, yeah, I've just got a question. So um, when create, when um, conducting the quality of interviews for kind of for the remote working and um, what kind of themes are you looking at for, for this project? Uh, so, uh, first of all, I'm asking about general experiences of remote working, seeing what people, yeah. basically seeing what data will emerge because we don't want to be too biased. Uh, but obviously, we would, we would um, explore the areas of the factors that predict this attitude to remote working and the, their preference to either stay at the office or to go back. Um, uh, sorry, to either go back to the office or to stay at home. So we would explore more attitudes and preferences. I would say that's the main interest. Okay, well, thank you. Very interesting. Okay. Any other questions or, you know, um, things people would discuss? I, I have a question uh, for you, Katie. Thanks, really, really awesome and very, yeah, very interesting. Uh, topic. So around the questionnaire that you are putting together in terms of teleworking, so it's still quite a, a new environment in which we're, we're working in. So do you see it a potential kind of um, uh, needing to uh, be updated and as, as we gain more insight with regards to teleworking or obviously you start from a, a very uh, youthful kind of way in, in terms of putting that together but do you see it kind of evolve over time to be able to capture more of, of relevant uh, feelings and perceptions of, of people? Oh, absolutely. That is a very good point that you're making, Justine. So basically, because teleworking is evolving so much, um, it will be changing. The nature of it will be changing. The factors predicting the desire to do it or not doing will be changing as well. So I would think that, uh, of course, the scale would need the modification later on. Uh, but at the moment, all, all what we can do is use the data that we have. And that will be the starting po point. And then, of course, we would develop it further. Okay. Any other questions? Thanks, well, good luck, Katie. It's super interesting. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Any other questions? I have a question. Um, sort of from the discussions you've already been having, the stuff that you've already been looking into, what we obviously a lot of organizations are coming to that point where they're looking at maybe what they going to be advising policy wise is going to be two days in the office three days what do you think the the win-win scenario the best possible outcome could be coming forward uh, so simply from what I've been talking with uh, participants, what they say and what how they experience it, I would say that the most satisfied ones that have uh, the ones that have a full choice whether to come to office full time or whether not to come to the office full time. So that will obviously be um, the the perfect. Um, environment uh, in terms of um, the, how employees see it. However, there is one caveat to it, which also was mentioned, is the fact that uh, because there is um, there is going to be a proportion of people who do remote working most of the time, uh, employers uh, decrease the number of office spaces and offices th that they have. So what is going to happen if everyone wants to go into office at, at, at one day? So that is a bit of a caveat to that. Um, 
yeah so hope that answered your question yeah, no, no. Yeah, absolutely from sort of the research that I've been doing into it that kind of was the the thoughts I was having that you know you can't please everyone it's probably going to have to be a flexible kind of make your own choice model but yeah what you say about offices is it's going to be a real challenge yeah lovely and you're so obviously happy for people to connect with you absolutely yeah. I would love to talk to you guys and if anyone is in academia and would like to write a paper together have a late liaison I'm happy to do that as well great thank you so much Katie Okay, so next up we have Command. Command, do you want to come and introduce your topic? Hi, yes, my name is Command, and I just finished my uh, MSc in Occupational Psychology from the University of Hertfordshire. And I did my dissertation in collaboration with Zest Psychology that uh, was running their pilot of the Authentic Confidence Program. So I was evaluating it and seeing um, was it really working? What changes can be made? So I particularly chose this. This was an opportunity that was given as compared to others who have been uh, kind of controlling what their research is about. And I took this up firstly because um, it was for the underrepresented in the organization. It involved the embodiment element, which I hadn't really heard of before. And it was again about authentic confidence and which I feel is really important for like leaders and leadership positions. And like, I'm really interested in the topic of leadership as well as um, I think uh, being at my first research, it was really helpful to have that framework and that set process as to uh, uh, that was given in the first place. So yes, uh, I'll just go ahead and share my screen so that you all can see my poster and I can kind of say it's, there are too many words, but that's the requirement at the moment. So the design involved uh, me doing both quantitative and qualitative research study. Qualitative was definitely my favorite because it had interactions with people. And um, yes, uh, I could then go forward and just present the video that I made for the organization and which clearly just represents the whole um the whole findings yeah. yes oh come on does it have um sound to it when you it share does. your screen, you have oh. to share audio as well. I think because I'm very myophones, it. Can you? Hello, I am going to introduce you to the Authentic Confidence Program. My name is Kamant, and as part of my research project, I evaluated the learning platform that was built to enhance an individual's authentic confidence in the workplace. The program is aimed at, but not restricted to the underrepresented in the organization. As a researcher, I was interested to hear their experiences of using the platform. Come, I'll show you what I found. The program is developed based on the EDI model that aims at building the self-confidence of employees. It highlights confidence as not only of the mind and emotions, but of the body as well, taking into consideration the strong physical experiences and individual experiences during a loss of confidence. In addition to the embodiment factor, high confidence is characterized by the social factor of being articulate and showcasing one's work. The model was developed engaging a diverse population, thus supporting coaches in developing a diverse set of leaders. The model includes components of authenticity, competence, mindset and connectedness. The program aims at increasing the confidence and resilience of participants and decreasing their anxiety. Learning starts with the Authentic Confidence Foundation module, and then learners navigate their own path through the other modules. 
The main research findings involve participants expressing having felt a tangible improvement in their confidence, their mindset, and their actions. Participants shared an increase of self-awareness, wherein they are now able to identify their triggers and skills that they either have and didn't know about or have to develop. The content was described as being relatable, easy to follow, practical, and genuine. Participants are better able to process and handle situations, engage in self-talk, reason, and be more positive. Lastly, the quantitative data showed confidence feeds into resilience. In conclusion, I do recommend the program because the data shows that confident employees make a resilient organization, which is especially important in the dynamic and challenging world that we live in. A decrease in anxiety means that the employees will be healthier and continue in the organization. Lastly, an increase in resilience and confidence will result in better performing employees and in turn benefit the organization as a whole. Thank you. Please feel free to get in touch with me or Zest Psychology. Um, yes, that was it. And I'd like to take any questions now. Great. Thank you so much for presenting, Kaman. Yes. Any questions? Yeah. Hi, Kaman. Thank you for presenting your research. That was really interesting. Um, I wanted to know a little bit more about that part where you mentioned participants during the program could then navigate to their own paths. Could you tell me a little bit more about how that process was done or what, what it was like for the participants? Where the participants, so um, I think they became more confident in the sense where they could now, um, you know, instead of relying on somebody else to provide them advice or, you know, keep on nudging people, uh, they could, they were more confident and they didn't really need that anymore. So it was particularly came out when one of the participants said that I don't really need anybody else to advise me anymore. I would like to listen to myself and think about a solution. Okay, cool. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? I actually have one myself. Um, the learning platform and the sorts of things that were, you know, what did it actually, what was, what actually was it? What sorts of things were people um, engaging with on this learning platform? Um, so I think because it was, it was, um, I think it was something really new, but they were also relatable. It was also relatable to them. So the engagement was particularly just um, watching the videos and filling up a few questionnaires and doing a few mindful activities. Okay. So that, that's how they were engaging with it, yes. Yeah, nice. And were these sorts of activities and um, you know the information they were learning about, was this based in on evidence and theory and research? It was actually, yes. And there has been one or two articles that the founder herself has written, co-written with other people. So, yes. Lovely. Thank you. Yeah, that answered my question. Has anyone yeah. else got any questions? Great. Well, thank you so much for presenting. You did amazingly. Um, um, and are you happy for people to connect with you? Definitely, sure. Great. Thank you. Okay, so next up we have Matthew. Matthew, would you like to come and introduce your topic? Hi, yep. Yeah. Good morning, hope you're having a good Wednesday. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here. I have a little presentation. One sec, technical difficulties. The technical difficulties. Classic, isn't it? <laughs> um, oh, this is the wrong one. I've got so many tabs open. <sighs> I'm really bad for it. I'm like really bad for that. Um, okay, here we go. So my topic is, um, I went to University of One and obviously I studied occupational psychology and this was um, my dissertation. 
and it was exploring the role of learning styles for job crafting and wet performance in quantity surveyors from United Kingdom. Um, I, I mainly did this because I was very, I have my, all my friendship group, um, about 15 to 20 of them are quantity surveyors. So I was kind of really interested in to kind of going into more in-depth discussion with them and being able to understand what they do for work and just kind of get more understanding of what's actually going on. And when I started doing some more research into it, it was actually really evident that the construction industry was is is kind of a it is a three hundred million dollar industry, and there is kind of core problems within performance due to it being a deadline structure. It's quite hardcore that you have to hit your deadlines for the project management and um, things going like construction is going up all over London. So it was quite an interesting topic for me to go into. I thought. So one of the first objectives was kind of understanding that and doing some research around it, of course. And then, so then it was kind of just exploring the performance and what am I going to kind of use to measure this? And I came across job crafting, which I kind of became a little bit obsessed with. And job crafting kind of, um, kind of is shaping how people shape their own work environment to fit their individual needs. And it's kind of broken down into three subsections of cognitive crafting, task crafting, and relationship crafting. Um, and then wanted to also explore kind of the people's um, preference for learning styles. And I came across the Kolb learning style um, because it was quite, it had four topics of converging, accommodating, assimilating, and diverging. And I'll kind of go into a little bit more about what they are um, later. And then I kind of just wanted to assimilate these together and explore them through um, means of mixed methods. So I, I use um, mainly qualitative aspects, but um, did a kind of a light bit of quantitative because um, I do like numbers. I like to want to display a bit of descriptive stats, statistics, um, but it, I, I mainly use a, a semi-structured qualitative approach to explore the job crafting and learning styles. And then solely just for um, learning styles, use a quantitative descriptive approach. And the kind of stance that I took was an epsilon, oh, I can't even say it right now, it's been a long day, <laughs> I'm gonna try to, um, which is kind of soft positivism. And it kind of, that is kind of the revealing the pre-existing phenomena and relationship between them. And um, so yeah, the the my participant sample was quite, easy for me to acquire because it was my friends. I did kind of uh, reach out on LinkedIn, et cetera, but mainly was my friends. And so that was really enjoyable experience. I know it's quite difficult, especially during COVID to get participants. So that was a, a definitely advantageous for me. And uh, I used the cold questionnaire, the 1984 version to produce my descriptive statistics. Um, so here was kind of the results. Um, task crafting is kind of, sub themes were adding tasks, reducing tasks, redesigning tasks, and mainly people would kind of add tasks, would, would kind of going around on site, maybe telling that worker over there who hasn't got his hard hat on to put it on. And um, reducing tasks might be people are a bit shy on the phone sometimes, and you have to do a lot of dealings with other clientele. So some people will reduce their tasks, and that would have a ne negative um, connotation on their performance. And then redesigning tasks can kind of be how you might structure the pricing aspect of, um, of the jobs and maybe using kind of digital um, aspects instead of just pen and paper pricing or looking back at old documents. Um, relation crafting was probably the most prominent because in this in quantity surveying, it's a lot of talking to contractors, subcontractors, clientele all the time. So you have to be on the phone and building those relationships because that ultimately can get you kind of a reduced deal maybe on uh, a price, etc. So building those relationships and altering those relationships, um, even at work as well with the colleagues, it kind of would help maybe in, improve their performance because you could delegate um, jobs to people more easily. Um, and then cognitive crafting was kind of more linked to the, their perceptions. And it was kind of taking a step back from work and looking at the bigger picture, picture of like kind of the whole project it's quite a deadline structure so people would kind of look at um the deadline and then take a step back and see how am i going to process this and how am i going to get the job done to meet this deadline and the learning styles um here so they kind of split up into four and then each one each the two of the top ones two of those combined create um one of these styles and it was hypothesized that there would be quite a convergent style which is related to goal setting and problem solving skills because it's quite 
that's what I believe from the research that people were um, quality surveyors were more kind of attracted to in their learning style. And the results kind of showed this, not um, significantly. I, I didn't do a, a further analysis, so that would be more interesting to look over. And then future research, yeah, could kind of look at using the, the most up-to-date Kolb style. I didn't actually have the funds to do that, so I had to use the old one. It's a little bit annoying, but it has way more learning styles, so it'd be way it would be very interesting to kind of dive into that and kind of see where that leads leads us. Um, kind of looking at also the perceptions of supervisors when people kind of add tasks or create le um, relationships. Kind of that that side of it would be interesting to explore. Um, and yeah, the implications for the research finally would kind of be that the. The main takeaway was when people did um, use positive crafting, kind of adding tasks, adding relationships, it would help their performance. Um, so it was kind of proactive crafting. And then when you had avoidance crafting, as I explained, kind of being shy on the phone, et cetera, or reducing relationships, um, this would have a negative impact. Um, and, it, and for kind of HR and human resources, I think it's very important kind of implementing these bottom up approaches for people. I think job crafting is one way that you can really engage employees in kind of all sectors, not just quality surveying. I think it's a really interesting topic to take into any any job and kind of how you might process your work looking at three different sections. And yeah, they was kind of the most um, prominent ones for me. Um, thanks for listening, guys. Lovely. Thank you so much, Matthew. Has anyone got any questions? Don't be shy, guys. <laughs> Hiya. Um, well done, that was really great. Um, I really like it. I do like the job crafting pieces. Um, obviously, you went through the implications, but what would be the main recommendation that you would give to the contracting industry based on what you found? Um, I think it would probably be that using these, these this technique would kind of be a cost effective way to implement kind of an, an engagement strategy for the organization to kind of help improvement and kind of focusing on predominantly relationships and building relationships and focusing on potentially the learning style and making sure that when you're delivering training etc that it's focused in on these kind of goal setting and um, problem solving aspects of the, the job in the whole. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Any other questions? So just a quick, um, obviously you mentioned yeah, no your um, friends as uh, participants or sort of, you reached out on LinkedIn, but majority of them were friends. How did you find yeah. sort of that dynamics? Were you interviewing them? Did you find, you know, how were you sure that they were telling you truthful information? Um, I, I think because we had that, obviously my friends a little bit of rapport. First off, I was kind of telling them beforehand, let's, let's take this serious, okay? <laughs> you know, let's, uh, I think you can be a bit more frank with people and a bit more open. So it was, um, obviously they knew this was for a big project and something that I was really interested in. So I don't think my friends were actually jeopardized like that. Wouldn't be what my friends is today. But yeah, that dynamic was quite weird at first. It's quite explore. I wanted to explore it as well and see how, because it'd be more comfortable because I hadn't done qualitative interviews like that before and I did mainly qualitative research so doing exploring the qualitative side was um, I wanted to make a challenge for me and really kind of explore it because I didn't want to get my degree and only do quantitative research I wanted to do everything you know. No I can see how it could be beneficial to do it with people that you're already familiar with so you can get used to the sorts of skills that you would need for interviewing so yeah lovely any other questions? Yeah, definitely. And you're happy for people to connect with you on LinkedIn? Uh, yeah, hundred percent. I, I put my my thing on LinkedIn there. And if anyone's anyone's looking for a job in L and D at the moment, it's systematic hedge funds. Get me. I'm a crew. I have to say it. It's in my blood. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, or just let me know if you know any friends. Um, be great. Great. Always Thank you so speak. much for presenting, Matthew. Well done. Um, no worries. So Thank you. Next up, we have Yaya. Yep. Right. Still with us. Hiya. Yep. Still here. So I'll just uh, share my screen. 
Disclaimer, like Matthew, I'm actually, uh, we came from the same cohort for from Nottingham for MSCOP. Good to see you, Matt. Yeah. Good to see you, yeah. Be a long time. Yeah, it has indeed. Um, is that sharing? I can see that. Right, so if I do the full screen, it should be the full. Yeah, perfect. Brilliant. So, um, my topic was on looking at the work-life experiences of child-free British men. Um, I consider myself to be a child-free individual, so it was a topic close to heart. And when I first considered the topic and I looked into academic research around uh, those who are child-free, I was pleasantly surprised to see there was a lot more than I expected. More in line with my expectations was the lack of research around work-life experiences or working experiences whatsoever of child-free individuals. So given that lack of research, I went for a qualitative study um, using interpretive phenomenological analysis, IPA, something I hadn't touched on since my second year of my bachelor's. <laughs> so it was, it was a good challenge getting, uh, getting back into that and conducting um, some research on that. So the aims of my research really was to look at what were the experiences of child-free employees in the workplace their perception of their organization's responses to their child-free status. Now, this didn't just include um, an organization as a whole. This was their, their colleagues, their customers or clients, depending on the what kind of role um, they were doing. And the last research aim was to look at what they believe organizations could do to support them as child-free employees. So as I mentioned, it was an area that really was under-researched and IPA as a nuance uh, of IPA as a method is to specify quite specifically your samples. Um, quite, quite an interesting thing I had to do and, and engage with in discussion with my supervisor, but I'm glad I did what I did as um, I had a very nice subsample really of a wide range of child-free, potentially child-free individuals, which was um, British and male. Um, I'm also glad I did what I did because it did help my um, finding my sample a little bit, but I'll get into that in a moment. And really, I wanted to look explore the, the experiences and see if there's any implications for diversity management practices, because the theoretical lens I looked at um, this at was the managing diversity paradigm, which, um, as you may or may not know, it has, it has a focus on the individual differences and how that can be utilized both by individuals um, as well as organizations for maximal benefit. So for the business case, but also a moral case and respecting individual differences. Um, in this case, the focus of being child-free. <laughs> so it was a, a very interesting experience to do interviews that lasted a bit longer than I expected. Um, but I'm glad I did. Uh, I'm glad they lasted as long as they did because I got quite a bit of rich data, as, as is in the nature of qualitative studies. I designed a what I thought was a brief questionnaire for nine open-ended questions, but with some participants, a total of I had five. Um, I only uh, the questions only went on for about 30, 40 minutes. But um, I I had the opportunity to really explore through novel prompts beyond my my schedule. And that gave some participants the chance to explore positive experiences that they had being child-free, which some of them came in and disclaimed that, hi, I wanted to participate because I know that um, our community tends to have an echo chamber of negative experiences. And that really was what I was expecting, but having participants come in um, to say that was, was a really interesting thing. And that was something I acknowledged as part of my credibility strategy for a little reflexive journal I kept. I didn't have much space to talk about reflexivity within my study, but thankfully I had a, a little bit at the end. Um, I would have liked to talk about a lot more, but um, in terms of other credibility strategies, my first participant was a pilot interview. Um, nothing changed from the pilot. So their, their interview and the contents there remained. Uh, the findings were three superordinate themes and seven subordinate themes. Uh, they more or less correlated pretty well, uh, say correlate, but related pretty well um, to the research questions. So the first superordinate theme was what it means to be child-free. Um, this explored what 
they really thought about being child free in a more holistic sense and some experiences of how their choice was validated or invalidated through the experiences of bingos or anti-bingos and bingos is, is, are essentially statements that are directly invalidate a child free individual's choice to be child free and this is uh, something that can apply to all um, identities of different types so for example a child free individual could say um, I don't want children because uh, of whatever reason and someone could say oh don't worry you'll change your mind um, or you're too young for that those counts as bingos um, so when we moved on to the second theme um, the participants did actually share mixed experiences some of them had uh, talked about differential treatment um, clearly negative experiences which actually led to them quitting their job um, and some talked about more neutral experiences, highlighting how, in their case, being child free was a non issue. It wasn't something that even came up at work. And that really balanced out, I would say, the, the positive to negative experiences. Um, in, in the positive experiences, some had anti bingo. So they talked about how colleagues would uh, be like, oh, it's nice. You, you have the free time to go home. You have nothing, um, you, you know, you don't have to worry about taking care of XYZ. Uh, and some individuals pointed out in the interviews that this is taken as a positive thing. Some of them would have actually talked about how they might have taken that as a negative thing. But moving on, the last theme was more about um, supporting child-free employees, so how they thought they could be supported. And surprisingly, what I found was the first thing uh, quite a few of them uh, said was how they wanted their organization to focus more on supporting their parental colleagues because that has a knock-on effect that if the parent colleagues are adequately supported, then they themselves would be supported as a, lead, as, a, as a secondary effect because their workloads aren't being impacted for inadequate support. Um, they then talked about more direct ways of how they could feel supported, which included um, acknowledgement and rewards, but they also acknowledged some hurdles that this would have, uh, for example, in uh, any HR based barriers to let's say monetary rewards, because as, as someone mentioned that there's, uh, there could be a sense of discrimination to parent or colleagues if they were being paid a little bit more because they're um, doing a, a certain task because they're free, that isn't within um, an overtime sense. But there were some more details and a lot of uh, rich quotes from um, participants. But uh, the suggestions for future research really focus more on the qualitative areas. So other cultures, other countries, I would have loved to look at cross-cultural factors. My, um, my um, introduction, the research had a few um, cross-cultural uh, uh, backgrounds for child-free research, not in the work psychology domain, but something I did talk about. Uh, it would have been great to collect some, uh, relate to some demographic uh, subpopulation variables because it, Child, even within the child-free community, differences in being child-free exist depending on level of education, religious belief, et cetera. It would have also been interesting for follow-up follow quantitative studies around what uh, child-free employees perceive of diversity management practices within their organizations. As for organizational implications, um, it's really about making sure that diversity management practices are inclusive, um, I, I've already talked about the indirect and direct support, so that the slide is really just summarizing that. But yeah, no, happy to take any questions. Great, I can see a hand up. Yeah, that's me. Uh, sorry, I've got my video off because I am multitasking and cooking dinner at the same time. No worries. <laughs> it was just a, a thing. Your research reminded me of um, something I got involved in briefly during my undergrad. Um, and there's a gentleman called John Barry. I don't know if you've come across him. Um, he was trying to set up a male psychology branch of the British Psychological Society, mm -hmm. um, working a lot with a woman that I studied with called Louise Lydon. Um, and he was, I don't know whether it got published because I lost contact with him, um, but was doing a lot of research on kind of child free or childless in mm. men and the differences between the two. So it was, if you wanted someone to, um, I think I recognize David's name. David, did you do the OU psych degree? Uh, is, is that me, David Biggs, are you yeah. after? Yeah. Oh, hi. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the male psychology uh, uh, section that does exist, actually. 
it, yeah. it's now got a, a female um, uh, sort of leader who's absolutely brilliant. Uh, and uh, I, she was quite shocked about some of the tales that obviously I'm not going to share here, but uh, of, uh, of, of mine. I, I, I'm the opposite. I kind of had kids and wanted a family, but the, the, my, my, my ex-wife moved on and um, et cetera, et cetera. So, 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 so I, I, I won't go through that here now. But yeah, it's, it's a really interesting kind of view but because the male perspective is often ignored. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and actually, it's kind of weird but because even in our society, even in our court system, it's kind of like as long as you're a man you, and you're earning money and you're paying for your kids, then, then everything's all right. But, 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 but the thing is, is I, I'm really close to my, my children. I'm, I mean, one of them's 19. And she literally won't have anything to do with her mother, which I find really quite sad, actually. Um, but 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 there there lies the sort of problem, I think, sometimes in our society. So 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 with this study, it's really really good because you're looking at the kind of opposite of this. You're kind of looking at men who actually don't want children, and and I know both men and both women who have chosen their career over children. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I probably have done that to, 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 to a great extent of my life, um, but, but, but it, yeah, it's, 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 it's an absolutely fascinating uh, kind of study. But yes, the, 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 to answer your question, there is a male, male section. Yeah, I, 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 if you're not in contact with John Barry and kind mm -hmm. of male psychology is something that you're interested in, um, he's on LinkedIn. Um, I think you can contact him through the BPS, but he would be a really good contact for you. So I just wanted to put that out there. No, thank you. Yeah, no, I definitely uh, would love to connect with him. Um, uh, the, just to uh, comment, David, um, the literature review I did actually just validates what you said in terms of the whole perspective for females. A lot of the child-free research, in fact, the distinction between childless and child-free, Kayla, uh, Kayla, that you brought up, uh, was something I had to I had to emphasize that it's not the same thing. Um, child free, the free implies there's a choice, and that choice is important because um, it it goes against the grain that we have in the UK uh, that is pronatalism, um, which is the entire reason bingos is a, is a concept because uh, these statements might seem harmless to anyone who has children or expects to have children, but really they can be quite damaging and um, mentally induce defensive responses or seem seemingly defensive responses from child free individuals but anywho um any any other questions no lovely great thank you for sharing nice. if there's no other questions um yeah extremely interesting topic and i do think it's particularly interesting because um you know, you have that sort of dynamic in society at the moment where with children, you you know, there's that sort of push for male and female should be equal. Um, you know, if the man wants to stay at home and look after the children, but the woman wants to go back to work, that should be acceptable. But if there's not very much research into why children don't want to have men. It seems like we're not reaching equality with the sorts of areas we're looking into. Absolutely, yeah. But no, I'm happy to connect on LinkedIn. It's slightly further up in the chat, but I can relink that if anyone wants to follow up. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you so much. Well done. Okay. And last but no means least, we have Sabina. Do you want to present your um, topic? Hello, everyone. Yes, definitely. Let me just share a representation. Is it visible now? Yes. Okay, so hello everyone, and thank you for staying so long. Uh, the topic I want to present might not seem to be uh, directly related to occupational psychology, but the opposite is, is true, and I'm going to talk about it in a minute. Uh, my background is that I graduated uh, from the University of Aberdeen in an MSc uh, conversion degree in psychology, and I did uh, an undergraduate in business, HR and PR. So my journey uh, to uh, psychology is slightly different and longer, but really excited, exciting. And um, as I said, the topic, I'm, my passion is really like a menstruation, menopause, and and um, all the issues related, especially stigma and uh, communication taboos. And um, 
there is an emerging need in the workplace, I, I think, to address these issues that menstruates, menstruators uh, face at work. Uh, for instance, decreased productivity due to menstrual pain, um, lack of paid sick days covered by an employer, and the same applies to menopause. Uh, although my research wasn't focused on the workplace, but it targeted a wise uh, cisgender women, uh, I'd like to bring this topic to everyone's attention, really, and perhaps initiate discussion about its about its topicality in the occupational setting. So the uh, this research uh, I'm gonna share with you, my, yeah, might be might seem to be a bit further from the reality, but it's not really true. I also like during my research, I uh, managed to get in touch with the div uh, diversity and inclusion manager uh, from Vodafone company, who was really interested in how other businesses are approaching these, uh, uh, th this topic of menstruation. And they previously ran some internal campaign on menopause and also raising awareness about abortion and how all of this can be reflected in HR policies because nowadays um, I also worked in HR in um, large, large corporation and when I was involved in the sickness absence uh, management meetings really these like topics if I can if I can call them that way were raised but the company actually didn't know how to what 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 to do at, at, at that stay at that, uh, that point so it would be really uh, good if any one of you is working in an HR or in businesses or have access to it to really consider it and um, yeah perhaps make make some change so going to this research uh, i focused especially on menstruation in popular culture and more specifically on the impact of advertisement for menstrual hygiene products on uh, two constructs menstrual attitudes and self-objectification uh, there is a long established discourse of shame embarrassment and concealment rules that are related to menstruation and that suggests and those suggest that its occurrence is something really polluting and should be hidden from others um, although the topic of menstruation stigma is really novel in scientific research so there is basically non-existent papers on this topic there is evidence for uh, the stigma adverse consequences. Uh, the present study I did then um, aimed to investigate whether a westernized pop, uh, pop culture could play any role in tackling this phenomenon of uh, menstruation stigma. Um, so the, the research was uh, quantitative and it examined whether uh, two types of advertisement, contemporary and traditional for menstrual hygiene products, had any impact on menstrual attitudes and disembodied perspective on the self that was measured by state self-objectification theory. The state self-objectification theory is the temporary induced um, situation when the person is um, like perceived by the third person perspective. So um, let's say I am just thinking how others would perceive me instead of the first person perspective when I you know, feel my own needs and feelings. And the experiment employed within subject design to detect a small effect size. And um, after watching each advert type in, in a randomized order, uh, cisgender women uh, completed self-administered questionnaires of uh, both um, uh, self-objectification and, and uh, menstrual attitudes. And um, the paired samples t-test revealed significant differences across all subscales between both contemporary and traditional ads with small effect size, and the outcome supported both hypotheses, uh, and, uh, meaning that the contemporary ad increases positive menstrual attitudes and decreases say, uh, state self-objectification relative to traditional advertisement. So we can't talk really about absolute increases and decreases, but only relative to, to each type of the advert. And um, so therefore, as the result, uh, the specific characteristics employed in the contemporary uh, advert, the emerging marketing approach, um, seemed to have modest positive impact on cisgender women when combating, uh, when trying to break this menstrual stigma compared to its conventional counterparts. So on the slide, on the slide, you can see the bar chart 
of, of uh, with both ads. And uh, for uh, self objectification, I measured uh, two subscales of body surveillance and like the body control and body shame. And for the menstrual attitudes, there were uh, two subscales of um, perceiving menstruation as a natural event and then as something bothering. And you can see that the natural uh, subscale was uh, reverse coded to sustain the same direction of all uh, variables. So, yes, yeah, so I see, I just want to really highlight that I'm passionate about this topic, uh, also for personal reasons, so I might be biased because this, this should be like academic <laughs> research, but I try to be as much objective as, po as possible. And, um, or just to mention last last thing that uh, I am um, after what I graduated from the university and I and I completed this thesis, I went to volunteer to Georgia where I am right now and also like part of one part of my uh, volunteering activities is actually to run workshops for uh, girls and young women to break uh, taboos uh, surrounded uh, around menstruation. So I, I really have a great opportunity now to put in practice everything I, I learned during this thesis into practice and it's interesting really that uh, there are there are taboos and stigmas in both develop, uh, developed uh, as well as developing countries so although we are living in the 21st century there we, there is still a lot of job to be done so that's that's all about about that and i'm open to answer any of your questions if you might have Excellent. Thank you so much, Sabina. Yes, has anyone got any questions? Yeah, um, obviously, Sabina, you were saying, sorry, you go ahead. I'm <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, obviously, you were saying that you didn't really think it was very much an oxyc area, but just like, you know, listening to everything you said, it feels like it's, especially with the hate from, from HR route, like you said, I. You know, I have many meetings and people coming back from sick leave and things like this that are all around this area. So um, I, I just think it's a quite, it really is an oxide area, to be fair. I mean, how are you feeling now after doing the study? Uh, yes, yeah, I agree. I, I think this is really, there, there is like a big gap really among biz, in, in businesses and in HR in general, perhaps, I don't know, but it could be also related to these taboos that it, the people are not like brave enough, to be honest, to, to, to create like a separate section uh, for uh, sick leave. You know, and I, I know um, in Japan, uh, they actually have businesses like in law that they allow to have a paid uh, one or two sick days per month, you know, for anyone who, who says, um, you know, I, I'm suffering from like a massive menstrual pain. I, it would be beneficial for both sides, employee and employer, to have this day offered and just like coming to work and and not being productive. I, I think it's it's like both sided. Um, so, yes, and we can get inspired, inspired by each other and how I feel about it now I mean I, I think we have to just keep talking about it really to, to make some change to happen um and and be brave so also like uh, one of the reasons I, I I braved myself to to, to stand up uh, here today and and introduce you to this topic sometimes it's interesting even I feel sometimes uncomfortable to talk about it so openly uh, in front of everyone because I don't know their reactions and and so and it's also like my personal journey uh, to break the the, the ice um, but yeah like the more we talk about it then we can make some change some same same like uh, things with fertility you know like abortion and and so on um yeah <laughs> there's just still lots of work to be done to be honest but also i'd like to encourage all of you if if you have any contacts you know to to people who perhaps work work in diversity and inclusion or in other areas within hr who could make perhaps some difference so then it would be amazing well thank you for that Thank you too. Hey, I have a question as well. First of all, well done for, for conducting this. It's it's definitely much needed. Um, I'm wondering what is it about contemporary ads um, that makes them less likely to, um, I guess, inspire self-objectification? 
Mm -hmm. That's that's a really good question. Uh, so for this research uh, specifically, I used a Modi Body advert that was um, produced. The Modi Body company produces menstrual underwear, which is a sustainable, reusable uh, menstrual hygiene product. So it's eco-friendly, environment uh, environmentally friendly. And uh, what is the difference in comparison to traditional ad? Is that they uh, don't use euphemism, so. They they really call menstruation to be a menstruation and not one of those days, um, then uh, they use, you know, they, they really describe menstruation as it is. So they uh, portray menstrual blood uh, with red color, not blue. And they show the reality of the menstruation, such as cramps, um, you know, menstrual pain that is okay. Also, just situations from everyday life, like, for example, washing stained clothes or, um, you know, having a um, hot shower. Also, what else? What else? Yes, uh, focusing on the, on the individuality of the person. So they don't force you into feeling in certain way, but they give you the freedom to decide to feel however you want to feel. That's also like a, like a big difference. In comparison with traditional advertisements, for traditional advertisement, I used uh, two ads that were like shorter to make up uh, one minute a slot for, uh, for both um, contemporary and traditional ads. So that was uh, for all Always and Kotex brands, if you know them. And they were like always, there was always like a menstruating, menstruating woman in uh, like surrounded in public, you know, and always like uh, being extremely happy, wearing uh, uh, white trousers and so like unrealistic situations that we wouldn't face in, in real life. So making it, re making it really like artificial and not realistic at all. So that contemporary ads that makes it like less self-objectifying are really all these trends that avoidance of euphemism, uh, showing the reality of what it is and, and, and um, encouraging women to accept the reality rather than trying to, you know, hide it or, or saying, yes, we are all happy and, uh, no one should should notice it. And also in those uh, contemporary ads, uh, they were showing always like a, a scene of up to only two women. So really focusing on that um, intimacy also, rather than just like, you know, uh, the scene from the restaurant and everyone is happy being on a party. And so, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. No worries. Yeah. Um, Liz, you said that you um, your company has a big focus on women's health. What sort of stuff does that involve? You're there. Sorry, we did you say Liz? Yes. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. So, um, so we're looking at so we do a menopause program, and we generate awareness of endometriosis, and we're hoping to roll out a sort of fertility benefits, fertility awareness uh, program next year. So yeah, we're fairly active, but there's definitely loads more that we could do. Yeah. Great. Thank you for sharing. Yes. Any other questions then? Um, I'm sure, I can't remember what company it was, but I'm sure I've seen something in the um, in the news and or the headlines recently that there's a company that has now got policies in place for um, like fertility stuff and um all those sorts of issues um and menstruation these sorts of things but i can't remember for the life of me what company it was but i'll have to have a look and let you know yeah i've got a feeling some of the banks have recently announced um yeah there's definitely some companies leading the way i think channel four might do something or maybe itv but there's definitely some big companies that are sort of paving the way it's really good to see yeah it's all yeah, very, very pressing topic. Right, so that, thank you for sharing. That wraps up all of our presenters today. Um, I'd like to extend a massive well done to everyone who has presented today. You've all done amazingly and it's been really great to hear about what you're passionate about um, and what you've been researching. So yeah, and thank you for everyone who has, um, caught, who has added to the discussion and, um, and ask questions to really start that conversation. So yes, um, 
if anyone would like to pop their LinkedIn in the chats, I'm sure people would like to connect with you. But that is the end of this event. Excellent. Thank you so much, Eloise. And just a round of applause for Eloise for facilitating it all. <laughs> so thank you so much, <laughs> Eloise, for that. So um, this will be a regular thing, would be run every quarter. So the next one will be in three months. So keep your eye out for that. And if you have any other colleagues who might be interested, by all means, uh, well, invite them along. And thank you so much for presenting. And the uh, next event will be a comedy night on Friday at 6 p.m. So if you have nothing better to do on your Friday than to listen to jokes, which will probably be within one to two standard deviations from the mean, as far as humor, please do join us. It's the same Zoom link, no need to register. And otherwise, it'd be just great to hear from one or two of you, what were your key takeaways from today? Or alternatively, you can go onto Zoom and type it in. Let me just pop it again in the chat. It just would be interesting. Like, what was valuable? What? Yeah. Just yeah. over to you. Let me just share the Zoom again. Not the Zoom, Menti. Oof, long, long day. So either type into Menti or unmute yourself and share. What are your takeaways? Um, I, I mean, if I can just add, I, I thought it was really interesting. It, it kind of makes me miss being a program director of an MSc in occupational psychology because uh, it was only uh, I, a, a year ago I was the external examiner to Hertfordshire, but I am now an external examiner for, for another degree, but it's over in Dubai. So, so we don't have the same sort of connection, but yeah, I'm, I'm kind of missing run, running a MSc in Oxide, Nikita, that's scary. And, well, <laughs> indeed, it, the things we miss, but the key thing is, is uh, I'm glad it scratched that kind of itch. So glad to hear that, good. David. Yeah, cool, good. so anything else people thought of, you know, stood out for them? Stuart, what were your thoughts, if you're still there? Yes, I'm still here. Sorry, I was typing in the box when you said, um, when you asked me. Sorry, yes. Um, well, I've just put uh, the wide range of interesting research, and it's good to hear of unusual areas, or well, what I would consider to be you know, out of the normal um, sort of areas being researched. It was just really interesting and nice to hear some fresh research. Yeah. Absolutely. Very happy to hear that. Yeah, it is wide ranging. Can I, for example, it's also interesting how interjointed it has become right now with home workings. There's not even, even a clear differentiation where does occupational psychology end and teleworking and clinical psychologist and well being. You know, it's becoming much more interestingly intertwined. It's like the study on uh, representation of menstruation and advertising had a huge, uh, well, reverberation in a telecommunications company. And what sort of role it can play in DNI and how the advertising might be connected to workplace attitudes. And it's also wonderfully intertwined. So it's just wonderful to hear all that wonderful research that's being done. Anybody else wants to chime in before we wrap up? I really liked the male focus um, and I think we don't hear enough from men about how they experience life and think, feel, act, etc. So I'd really encourage more of that, please. Yeah, um, I, I, I resonate with that, Liz. And uh, one of my favorite things, I can't remember what poet it was, but it was a live show. And he said, I wrote the shortest poem in the world and that's how men talk about their feelings. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. So, oh, uh, did that uh, resonate with you? Yeah, yeah. That it did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to know the poet later. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll try to find it. Yes, uh, Kaylee, uh, probably messing up the name. No, 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 that was perfect. Uh, just what you said actually just sparked a thought. I've just Googled what the official definition of organizational psychology is, and it does say organizations and the workplace. So given that the workplace may no longer be an office or you know a, a co-working area, 
do we think that the scope of organizational psychology will change? Mm-hmm. Wow, that's an interesting subject. What do people think? Eloise, you seem to be smiling. Any particular reason? Well, I think as I've been sort of looking into hybrid working recently, maybe as um, Katie might be able to say, but actually, yes, COVID has sort of brought to light how work and that all doesn't, it never, mm, <laughs> fumbling over my words. Um, before COVID, there actually was a huge part of work and stuff like that being done at home. But I think COVID's just, illuminated that and really catalyzed a massive shift um so yeah i think it's just brought to light that actually occupational psychologists it's not just work in the workplace the workplace is everywhere it's about how you manage that time and balance those boundaries Mm -hmm. and if we really turn up the humanistic dial it's all about self-actualization at the (laughs) end of the day and the limits are limitless and um Yes. Yeah, so, so, sorry. Yeah, I was just going to add. I mean, I mean, with the teleworking, I, I mean, I, I was really interested in that in, in the, the mid 90s. And the AA had all these uh, kind of workers at home with these desks that they pulled out. Uh, and But the scariest thing, they were all monitored. So as soon as they pulled out the desk, a little camera would go on and there would then be like a central unit. So you could see everyone uh, at their desk working. So, so, so if you wanted to go for a, for a loo or something, you had to literally sign off the system and, 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 and you know, but, but that system, it, it will work for something like a, a call centre environment, but it won't work for like a professional. And as I said earlier, I'm, I'm, on, uh, I'm supposed to be on strike today, but, but yeah, I, I have been working. <laughs> I, I, I know that's really bad, um, but, but, but I, I kind of have to, because if I don't work and if I don't do something sort of now, it has repercussions, which are going to be much bigger are much larger so it's easier to nip things in the bug but sort them out now uh, and so that means less work in the future so so, so yeah it's i i find things like teleworking and flexible working absolutely fascinating you know and who says yeah, your employer go. does not turn on the camera when you open up their work laptop uh, you, well well they, they might do actually to be fair i didn't switch on my work laptop today uh, I'm just on this machine, uh, which is probably why it's slightly different orientation, because this is my business machine, so it's not linked to my work laptop. So yeah, Ooh, although so I have got think... it to my work, yeah, yes, not yeah, not via the laptop. The, but the question <laughs> of privacy and how much monitoring can you do, and can you capture all that data if you so can? I mean, yeah, uh, Stuart, the uh, tape over the camera also works, or is a little kind of yeah. thingy magic. But hey, the key thing is that what's really kind of cool is uh, going back to Kayla's point is that I suggest one of the key things you can do is knock site. Reach out to clinical, reach out to educational psychologists, start talking, reach out to HR, L&D, office designers, well-being practitioners, coaches, and really build up your network because that's the real key thing. The work is not siloed anymore. So why should our profession be as well? So hopefully we'll have more kind of clinical psychologists come and presenting their studies and learning from each other. So I think that's what makes it really exciting, but that might be just me. But hey, Eloise, any final words before we close off this session? Um, well, just on what you were saying, as I, as you were saying, I was thinking it. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's all psychology, and what is psychology? It's you know the behavior, you know, study human behavior. So what does it matter what perspective you take from it? Because you're you're still studying humans in different contexts and environments and from different angles. So yeah, there's so much value in in sharing with the other branches and professions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Louise, again for hosting the session. And just before we wrap up, Kayla, do you still have a question or is it just the hand up from before? It's just the hand up from before, sorry. It's all right, just checking. Well, thank you, everybody, and hopefully see you at the next event. And if you have literally nothing better to do on Friday for the comedy night, and thank you, everybody, for presenting. Thank you, everybody, for the wonderful questions, and Louise, once again, for facilitating. Thank you, everyone. It's an amazing thank you, everyone. Thank you. Ciao. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Nikki. Brilliantly, Eloise.
Amazing, guys. I'm gonna go, go, but really, congrats for